The Minister of Justice wishes to make a statement. Minister. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. With permission, I wish to make a statement on prison reform. This Thursday marks the second anniversary of the publication of the Prison Review Team report, which was led by Dame Anne Ors. I would like to update members on the progress that has been made since publication and outline the work that is taking place to make a positive impact on prisoners to reduce their risk of reoffending. The report calls for end-to-end -end transformational change across the prison system in Northern Ireland. Its 40 recommendations were challenging, but I believe then, and I believe now, that it set the roadmap to delivering an effective, efficient and sustainable service. I said at the time of publication that implementing the recommendations would be a long-term process and that we would have to put in place solid foundations if reform was to be embedded throughout our prisons. The service established a reform programme to put in place the foundations for delivery and to drive the necessary changes. The reform programme is at the halfway point. Good progress is being made. To date, nine recommendations have been approved as complete by the Prison Review Oversight Group, which I chair. This group provides oversight and scrutiny of the programme and includes a robust and challenging independent element. I anticipate that a further nine recommendations will be brought forward for sign-off by the group at its December meeting. If those are signed off, then almost half of the recommendations will have been implemented. That demonstrates steady progress. From the outset, I have said that implementing the reforms will be a process and not an event. That remains the case. As with any major reform programme, the pace of change can at times feel frustrating. The next year is a critical period when many of the recommendations from the OAS report will become a reality. A clear plan for delivery is in place. However, some of the major projects that are part of this will not be realised until nearer April 2015. This is normal in a complex reform programme. They take time to get right. However, this is not just about ticking off each recommendation. That is why I announced a number of initiatives in June that will make a real difference in the way our prisons operate and how we support people through custody and back into the community. Today I can announce that the two reviews I commissioned into the Prisoner Incentive Scheme and the categorisation of women and young people have been completed. The next stage is ensuring these are put into practice and discussions are ongoing with the Governors on how this will be achieved. Last month I published an employability strategy I can, and I can inform members that, as part of that, a new passport to employment has been developed and is soon to be piloted in McGabry. Prison service staff will also be working with NIACRO to link this work into the Job Track initiative. In June, I highlighted the issue of addiction in our prisons and announced that a new dual approach will be implemented to tackle this issue. The first part of this was the initiation of intelligence-led searching to replace the standard routine search policy. This is now in place. There is also a prison service PSNI initiative at McGabry, where they have joined forces to reduce the supply and demand of drugs in the prison. I also wanted to see support put in place for those with addiction issues. Prison staff are currently being selected to work on the new Cutting Edge Addiction Programme, which will be piloted in McGabry in the new year. This will be a complete programme regime which will support prisoners to break the cycle of addiction. It is the first of its type in the British Isles and demonstrates the innovative approach that prison staff are willing to take to deliver change. Since my announcement in June, a new directory of services has also been developed, which will provide prisoners with details of what support services are available. This will be launched later this year, following consultation with prisoners and key partners. One of the key areas in delivering for prisoners will be the outsourcing of learning and skills, which, it is anticipated, will happen around this time next year. This will increase overall levels of prisoner participation in employment and education across the three prisons. However, I am not content to wait until 2014 for progress in this area. Therefore, I can inform members that work to award an interim contract for learning and skills is currently being finalised and I expect letters of award to be issued next week. Awarding the interim contract not only delivers an enhanced service in the next year, it also allows the service to move to the next stage to establish the Hyde Bank College. This will be achieved through a college task force, which will be responsible for designing, developing and delivering both the college ethos and results. I can also announce that the concept college prospectus will be launched at the end of November. Another area that will interest members is the latest position on the prison estate, particularly future plans for women in custody. 
Our focus is a prison estate that is fit for purpose, which provides safe, secure and decent accommodation for all prisoner categories and addresses the specific needs of young offenders and women prisoners. Work to further define the future direction of travel for McGabry is ongoing and the future of McGilligan Prison has been set. As I have outlined, the Hyde Bank College will deliver positive interventions for young people in custody. Today I want to focus on the needs of females. I wish to put on record that I remain committed to having a separate prison for women. However, that will not happen in the near future. To address this, a four-stage approach will take place, which will deliver positive change for female prisoners. The first stage is the development of Ash House that will deliver an enriched regime, freer movement and greater access to services. Secondly, this will be coupled with the development of our Prisons Inspire concept within Alderwood House. The third phase will see res residential units also developed. All of this will be subject to the normal planning processes. The final stage will be the development of a new women's prison. I anticipate there will be high-level plans for this by the end of the year. Another key part of the reform will be how offender management policies are embedded across the service, and we have spoken at length about the need for an integrated approach to this. Unlike in other jurisdictions, prisons in Northern Ireland already have in place a policy to ensure every offender has a sentence plan. This is being achieved through the reforms and through our offender management hubs, which bring together staff from prisons and probation to ensure there is an integrated approach in this area. This is by no means the limit to our ambition, as we want to create an effective end-to-end -end resettlement process. I couldn't update the House on prison reform without acknowledging the major changes that have taken place within the workforce over the past 18 months. Many experienced officers and managers have left under the voluntary early retirement scheme, and we've seen the recruitment of hundreds of new officers. Many staff have also converted from support grades to become custody officers. This has been challenging for all concerned, but I believe we now have in place the right balance between new and experienced staff, which will serve our prisons and the wider community well into the future. One of the areas that has attracted attention from members is the new operating model for prisons that was introduced last October. The reason for doing this was to ensure we had the right people in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. The operating model encompasses four key elements. The staff deployment agreement, the staffing structure, the staffing profile and the shift patterns. In combination, this will deliver a sustainable model for our prisons that is both efficient and effective. The NIPS service profiling team has reviewed the implementation of the operating model at each prison, <coughs> excuse me, at each prison establishment over the last six months. NIPS will continue to develop, modify and enhance the shift patterns as part of business as usual. It is also important that operational staff have the skills to deliver the prison service that will create positive interventions that address offending behaviour. This means making sure all grades have access to the right training, which gives everyone the opportunity to build a career in the service. To deliver this, a series of training programmes have been developed for all staff, from main grade officers to senior officers, right through to management grades. This will include a year-long series of masterclasses that will address many issues from financial planning to incident management. Last month, it was announced that the University of Ulster has been awarded the contract to accredit the Certificate of Competence for our new officers. This was good news for them, as it will give them the opportunity to show the new skills they have developed through their training and in the workplace. Principal Deputy Speaker, I can also inform you that promotion boards are being held for functional head grades, and there will be promotion opportunities to the senior officer grade by the end of this year. Alongside this, former principal officers have become unit managers, and work to finalise the role of offender supervisors is almost complete. These are very positive developments for staff and demonstrate the service's commitment to give everyone the skills they need to do their job. Reforming the prison system in Northern Ireland is the biggest change programme in the public sector since the formation of the PSNI in 2001. It is a huge project. The recommendations from the OAS report were not straightforward. As I said previously, the vision of the report was to deliver end-to-end -end transformational change. That means changing the structures, ethos and culture of the people who work for prisons and how they work with those who are in custody, all of which has to be delivered within today's financial restrictions. The prison service is an organisation in transition 
and many people are working to make changes a reality. I am greatly encouraged by the work that is being done and the progress that has been made. As I have set out, these reforms are delivering for women in custody with a four-stage plan to provide a bespoke infrastructure and regime for female prisoners. They are delivering for young people in custody with the establishment of Hyde Bank College. They are delivering for all prisoners with the new interim learning and skills contract now in place and the outsourcing completed next year and with sentence planning for every prisoner the goal. The reforms are also delivering for our staff development plans for every grade to build their skills and career with the service. However, Principal Deputy Speaker, the reform of our prisons will ultimately be about making the community safer in Northern Ireland. This will be achieved by creating positive interventions to address offending behaviour which reduces the, ris the risk of re-offending. That is what I want the reformed prison service to deliver and I am confident that is what the reformed prison service will deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, and I call Mr. Paul Given, the Chairperson of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will know that we discussed some of these issues, uh, and it was highlighted that relationships are key. And I would impress upon him again to make sure that relationships between management and staff are, are working properly, as currently it has been indicated they are not. Uh, within this statement, uh, references made to the uh, voluntary exit scheme. Can the Minister give a, an absolute guarantee? that those 27 officers who still remain on the letter 3 option but have been accepted into the scheme will be allowed to leave the service, as it would be grossly unfair, having allowed uh, in the region of up to 500 officers to leave, that if there is a small element of these 27 that are kept within the service, despite them having signed up to it. So can he give that commitment that he will find the money from within his department or through a bid that these 27 officers ultimately will be allowed to leave the service? Well, I thank the Chair for his comments, and certainly I am committed to ensuring that we get the best possible relationships between staff and management in the prison service, allowing for all the difficulties that arise from such a programme of reform. I cannot, unfortunately, at this stage give him the guarantee that he asks that all those who have applied under the Voluntary Early Retirement Scheme will be able to leave. Uh, I am sure he heard the question that was asked of the Minister of Finance a few minutes ago, uh, and he indicated uh, his keenness to see that the scheme proceeded and acknowledged that there has been assistance from DFP last year in funding uh, towards that. I certainly hope it will be possible to obtain funding in this year, but the, the Chair of my committee is also well aware of some of the other pressures we face around issues like legal aid costs, which are currently creating significant difficulties this year. I trust that we will be able to see towards the end of the year that there is some way of allowing uh, that uh, final batch of officers and indeed some governors uh, to get the, you know, their leaving date, but at this stage I regret I can't give the guarantee he seeks. Thank you. And I call Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister both for his statement and his answer to the previous question? Uh, I mean, the Minister w will be well aware that you know, the, the urge report does present uh, an opportunity, indeed a challenge. I, I look forward to the oversight group coming to the committee just to tease out some of the, the further issues. But this is the halfway mark, uh, and the Minister has said it is not a ticking off exercise of the recommendations. But is he satisfied at the halfway that he is well? on target for reaching the final outcome and the, the final, uh, all the recommendations will be in place in time. Well, again, I thank the, the Deputy Chair of the Committee for his question. He correctly identifies we are talking about an extremely challenging process and at more or less the halfway point, <coughs> we are close, as I said in the statement, to having 18 of the 40 recommendations signed off. And that signing off is not a simple box tick. It is an issue that reports come to the oversight group which agrees them, they then pass to Sajini for validation of that. And as he would expect from the independent members of the oversight group, there is robust discussion at the oversight group uh, with not only me, but also officials from the prison service to see that is done. So I believe we are seeing significant progress, but we cannot expect that some of the more complex issues will be resolved until nearly the end of the process in the spring of 2015. But I do believe with the team which is currently in place, with the good work being done within the three prisons, but most particularly by the leadership team at headquarters, that we are seeing significant progress at this time, and I believe that we will see the reforms all in place by the expected closing time in the spring of 2015.
Or, uh, call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And could I thank the Minister for his statement? Uh, in a sense, the statement was preempted, uh, to some extent anyway, Principal Deputy Speaker, by the debate last week in relation to uh, prison reform. The Minister has acknowledged at paragraph 7 of this first page uh, that reform can be quite frustrating, the pace of reform can be quite frustrating, and I agree with him in relation to this. Could I ask the Minister, where is the logjam that is really preventing uh, the prison reform being fully implemented? And is that logjam, uh, as Mr. Given has identified earlier, uh, the relationship between staff and management? Well, again, I thank Mr. McGuinness for the question. Um, I hope that this statement wasn't entirely preempted last week. Last week was a debate around a negative report of the situation uh, which existed in Hyde Bank Wood in the early part of this year. I hope that this statement shows the significant progress that has been made, but I take the point, um, and we're also going to have some questions shortly in normal question time, which will probably cover much the same ground. I suppose the issue of the pace of reform is the complexity of the overall reform uh, uh, process made it quite difficult to get matters underway. There were significant issues around staffing in the time it took to get the senior team in place, and I do believe that the team that Sue McAllister now leads is one which will be capable of leading through all these reforms, as well as the changes which have been made in staffing in the three individual units. Uh, whether there is a logjam in terms of relationships, I'm not sure. I mean, we saw a, a withdrawal of goodwill by the POA earlier this year in terms of working overtime, uh, which has now ended. Uh, but clearly, the issue of maintaining good working relationships with the workforce going through such significant transformation is always a major challenge. And uh, it's not easy, as we know, in any part of the public sector to ensure that staff can always be brought along with that level of change. But I do think we have uh, at least seen in terms of uh, the recent uh, ending of the withdrawal of goodwill, that there is an option that we can move forward in a more constructive way now. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for, for the update. And, uh, he does mention, actually, uh, there is also a prison service PSNA initiative at McGabry where they have joined forces to reduce the supply and demand of drugs in the prison. Just wondering if the Minister can give us any more detail on uh, that project at, at the moment, or at least uh, at a later stage, if that's required, and how that progress on that uh, project will be both measured and monitored. Well, again, I thank Mr Elliott for highlighting what is quite a significant issue. Um, the issue of tackling drugs is actually a two-pronged uh, issue. The first part is the point that he highlights the work being done, uh, which has the involvement of the PSNI in a joint initiative at McGabry, uh, matters of looking to detect and deter the smuggling of drugs. Um, and it was interesting, though I need to be cautious when matters of subjudice, to note uh, that there were three arrests related to an attempt to smuggle drugs into McGabry just before we publicly announced that this initiative had started happening. So that is one part of it. The other issue is around an education issue um, in ensuring that we uh, see that prisoners are aware of the dangers of illegal drugs and indeed the dangers associated uh, with inappropriate uh, prescribed drug use. So there, is, uh, there, are, there are issues there. What is absolutely clear is that we need to fight the issue of drugs in prisons at a number of different levels. Uh, the partnership in terms of the prevention with healthcare is extremely valuable. The partnership with the PSNI in terms of detection is extremely valuable. And certainly it does appear at this early stage that moving away from routine regular searching to intelligence-led searching is having significant benefits. Okay, and I call Mr Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for uh, your statement. Um, as you've said, this is ongoing work, work in progress. But one area which has concerned us is the whole improvement of uh, women prisoners. Uh, can the Minister tell us more about the four stages that he intends to take uh, the improvement of delivery of services and ultimately the, the improvement of outcomes for women prisoners? Well, I thank Mr Dixon for the question, which highlights an area which has been of significant concern for some time. Um, the, f the four stages, just to give a little bit more detail on what I was able to say in the statement, are first of all seeking to improve 
the physical situation within Ash House in Hyde Bank Wood, acknowledging that it is likely to remain the residential unit for some time. So uh, work is going ahead to create, you know, create slightly different physical space, which will enable the development of vocational work on things like um, hairdressing and kitchen and laundry work alongside access to IT, improving the facilities which are offered in that building. A second stage is to use Alderwood House which is currently used by the probation service on the Hyde Bank site but outside the wall to create something of a step down and working out facility. Um, in, the, you know, in the first part of that, simply to provide some educational classes will be a possible use uh, which will enable people to move into a different atmosphere and will then work towards the work which is being done by the Inspire project in the city centre in terms of working with women offenders. Uh, we then hope that we will see some step-down residential units developed alongside Alderwood House as the third phase for those women who require a degree of supervision but who do not require significant custody as they move towards the end of the sentence and indeed further on out. And finally will be the major challenge of getting the right size of full women's prison off the Hyde Bank Wood site or at least outside the young offender's wall to ensure that we get a proper facility for women, which has been denied to women prisoners in Northern Ireland for many years. Thank you, and I call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for the statement of the House. Uh, Minister, in your statement, you made mention of training uh, programmes, and my colleague, the Chair of the Committee, has made mention of the key issue of relationships. You will be aware that the, chair, the representative of the Prison Officers Association has said there is a, a difficulty in terms of recruitment within the Northern Ireland Prison Service. Can I ask the Minister, given that there was a void in terms of leadership and management at Hyde Bank Wood for uh, over a year with no governor, deputy governor, new governor being English, three of the senior management team in front of the committee last week being English, is there an issue about Ulster people being recruited at senior management level within the prison service in Northern Ireland? <clears throat> well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I really do get slightly surprised the number of times complaints come from the unionist side of this assembly at the employment of British citizens who happen to live on the other side of the water. The reality is we have an employment process which is open competition and we seek to employ the best person for the job. Yeah, yeah. And if the best person for the job happens to speak with an accent which suggests that they come from one side of the water or the other, that is not a relevant consideration. Yeah. The consideration is are they the best person with the experience for the job? The reality is, whilst I acknowledge that uh, Mr Humphrey talks about specifically among senior officers of the prison service, the reality is a very small proportion of prison service staff come from outside Northern Ireland. And if we see a process where some people move one way across the Irish Sea and others move the other way at different times, it seems to me that that is a benefit for enriching the services on both sides of the water and not something we should complain about. Thank you. And I call Ms Rosie McCorley. Last Concordia, August Carm Falcher, Riv Righteous and Ira New. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's statement today. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, could he elaborate on the high level plans for the women's prison, and will that have the effect of bringing forward the date for whenever that, that uh, facility will be provided? And in the interim period, will the uh, improved services for women include making it uh, freely available for women to avail of day release to partake in work? Well, I thank Ms McCauley for the question, though I'm afraid I don't think I can elaborate any more on the issue about the, you know, the long-term replacement for Ash House. I hope to be saying more about that probably early in the new year to the House, and I will certainly give a commitment to inform the committee, if not the full House, at the earliest stage possible. Uh, in terms of how we seek to make the changes, then uh, the important issue is to ensure that women get the opportunity to avail of a variety of opportunities, depending on individual risk assessment. And we know that many of the women who are in Ash House are perfectly capable of leaving the wall of Hyde Bank Wood to engage in some form of training, some form of day activity. That's been happening for some time, with some of them going to the Inspire project in the city. And the issue is if we can develop uh, schemes in Alderwood House which allow a greater number to benefit from that. And clearly, on the basis of individual risk assessment, that is what we should be doing to prepare women for release from custody. And that is what we will be seeing more of in the coming weeks. Thank you, Minister. Uh, as